Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Dr. Conor O'Mahony, who's a, an expert in constitutional law, um, among other things, at, at the faculty. And um, Conor and myself have done some work together on this, together with, uh, particularly with, with Catherine O'Sullivan, where we've submitted um, our thoughts on, on the issue to uh, the Oireachtas Committee and also so published a number of pieces on this. Um, um, but Conor is, is going to give us um, the nuts and bolts of what's proposed, a little bit about the background and, and the first, I suppose, mo moving the debate on a little bit onto the wording and, and then the purpose, I suppose, of, of raising our own awareness about what that, the implications of that might be. Conor Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you very much for coming along today. Um, so as Ursula said, uh, my role today is to get into the specifics of the constitutional amendment in a little more detail. So Emily has very usefully given us the policy background and the sort of practical day-to-day -day issues which are relevant to this proposal in terms of dealing with children who are in care and who are involved uh, in various other uh, difficult family situations due to uh, family disputes or neglect or abuse or other situations like that. Um, so what I want to do is to locate that in the constitutional framework uh, to talk about what the constitution says at the moment and how this amendment, if it is put to be put to a referendum, how it proposes to change the constitution from the current position. Uh, I'm conscious of the fact that some of you are lawyers, some of you will be very specialised in, in this area, uh, but others are not lawyers and perhaps will not be very familiar with the legalities and with the technicalities of it. So I'm going to try and pitch this at a level somewhere in between so that everybody can, can access it. Um, so just to briefly uh, remind everybody what the Constitution actually says at the moment uh, about the family, it provides in Article 41 of the Constitution in particular uh, it provides very strong protection for the rights of the family unit as a unit. The Constitution recognises the family as the fundamental unit group of society and uses this very strong language of natural law in describing it as a moral institution which possesses inalienable and imprescriptible rights antecedent and superior to all positive law. So that's very striking, very strong wording in terms of the protection for the family. And the implication of that is that the state guarantees to protect the family in its constitution by striving to keep the family together and in its authority by not interfering with decisions which are made by the family. Now in addition to that, the constitution also recognises specific rights of parents and in particular in Article 42 it recognises uh, the family and parents as being the primary and natural educator of the child and the courts have viewed that as applying not just in the education context but to also to general upbringing issues. And then as a fallback default position, Article 42.5 provides that in exceptional cases where parents fail in their duties, uh, the state can intervene so as to protect the natural and imprescriptible rights of the child. So that's a, a very brief whistle-stop tour of the relevant constitutional provisions. And so to summarise that, where it leaves us in terms of looking at the constitutional position of children is that the Constitution of 1937 provides very extensive rights and very strongly worded rights for the family unit as well as a number of specific rights for parents, um, whereas it scarcely mentions children at all in the Constitution at the moment. Now where that has led us to um, in, in the, the legal position, uh, it, it all comes down to, as Ursula mentioned, the reach of the Constitution and, and how the impact of that document filters down through the legal system and then in turn into practice. At a statutory level, we have provided for what is known in Ireland as the welfare principle or the best interest principle under the Children's Rights Convention. And that is provided for in a range of the relevant legislation, the Guardianship of Infants Act, the Adoption Act, and the Child Care Act. Uh, but the important point to note is that while in principle Irish law says that the welfare of the child is the first and paramount consideration for the court, Irish law only says that at a statutory level. And because that is at a statutory level, uh, statute law of course must be read in light of the Constitution. And what we've seen in the case law is that the courts have interpreted the statutory welfare principle 
in the light of the very strong rights expressly afforded to the family unit and to parents in the Constitution. And this has led to a concept known as the presumed best interests of the child. And the way in which the concept of presumed best interest works is that, in essence, when the court asks the question, what is best for the welfare of the child in this case, it approaches it from the standpoint that we presume that the child's welfare is best protected within the family. Now, when we say the family, of course, because the Constitution only recognises the family based on marriage, that presumption only applies to the marital family. If the parents are not married, well then the presumption does not apply. The presumption as a starting point makes sense. I think everybody would agree that we should presume that a child's welfare is best protected in its own family. I don't think anybody would argue with that. What has led to a lot of the calls for reform in this area is the question of what does it take to rebut that presumption? Because of course any legal presumption is open to be rebutted. Um, what does it take to rebut the presumption that a child's welfare is best served by remaining in the family and subject to the family's decision-making authority? Well, in the case which established that presumption, Reg H, an infant, uh, it was found that an identifiable risk of psychological harm to the child uh, was not sufficient to rebut the presumption that the child's welfare was best served within the family. Uh, we saw that again more recently in the Baby Anne case of 2006. Uh, those two cases were almost identical. We saw in each case the court ordering that a child who had been placed with respective adoptive parents for over two years should be returned to the natural parents in spite of the risk of identifiable psychological harm that uh, arose from the process of returning a child after such a long gap, having bonded with the adoptive parents and so on. What's also striking about those cases is the relevance of the fact that the parents were married and thus able to invoke Article 41. Because we have a number of cases on our, on our books whereby parents who were not married sought to have a child returned having been placed for adoption after sometimes far less than two years. And in the cases where the parents were not married and thus not able to invoke Article 41, the courts invariably found that it was not in the best interest of the child to return to the natural parents because of the risk of harm, and that the best thing for the child was to remain with the adoptive parents. However, once the parents marry and are then able to invoke Article 41, we see the courts going in the other direction. And so we see that the presence of Article 41 and the ability of parents to invoke Article 41 in a case, it specifically alters the court's conception of what is in the best interest of the child. The other case which is well known in this area is the, the PKU case uh, from 2001, uh, where parents refused their consent for a, a heel prick test on their newborn baby. Uh, and the court in that case found, and the court unanimously agreed, that it was in the best interest of the child to carry out the test. Uh, but in spite of this, applying the presumption that the parents um, were the best people to make this decision, uh, the court said that this presumption could only be rebutted if there was an immediate and fundamental threat to the capacity of the child to continue to function as a human person. And so, in other words, the courts are suggesting that because of the rights available to married parents under Article 41, that intervention is only permissible in cases of the most serious levels of risk to a child. And that comes back to, to Emily's point earlier on, relating to the idea of too much intervention too late. This exception uh, in Article 42.5 of exceptional cases has been construed so narrowly that intervention often does not occur until far too much time has passed and really it is too late. And intervention at that point perhaps um, isn't always necessarily that helpful. So the calls for reform are not about trying to, to fundamentally change things. They're not about trying to say the family doesn't know best. Um, the idea, as I said, that the family is the best place for a child, everyone would agree with. What the calls for reform are about are saying that we've taken that presumption too far, that we have construed the uh, circumstances in which the presumption can be rebutted too narrowly and set the bar too high. And so it's about taking uh, the best interest principle, which we have committed ourselves to as a matter of statute law since the 60s, which we have signed up to as a matter of international law for 20 years, and making that fully operable because the constitutional provisions have distorted the way in which the principle is applied in Irish case law. So 
what we've seen in terms of the calls for reform, this is, is not a new issue. Uh, the, the original call for reform in this area came from the report of the Kilkenny Incest Investigation in 1993, and that's been followed by a whole host of recommendations since then. Uh, the Constitution Review Group reports from NGOs such as the Children's Rights Alliance and charities such as Barnardo's, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, and so on and so forth. Uh, a range of academic commentators have also made this call. Uh, but of course, any attempt to alter the Constitution requires a referendum, and a referendum has to be initiated in the houses of the Oireachtas, and has to pass through the Oireachtas before being put to the people. And so the general practice in Ireland is that a referendum will only be held where cross-party support can be obtained. So it's quite a lengthy and difficult political process. Um, and so what we've seen as a result of this is a, a number of reform reports and reform proposals being put forward with various different wordings. Uh, there was a bill published in 2007, which I won't dwell on because of time constraints. The 2007 proposal was supposed to uh, make a change to the way in which the constitutional framework balanced the various rights and interests at stake in this area. But in reality, on closer analysis, uh, most people agreed that it, it wasn't fit for purpose. It didn't do what it purported to do. And so, subsequent to that, the Joint Oireachtas Committee have spent two years working on this uh, and have put forward a new proposed wording. And so, what I'm going to focus on is just to look at that wording quite closely uh, to explain what it is attempting to do, why it is attempting to do it, uh, and then offer a brief view of my own uh, towards the end on uh, whether or not it is a good proposal. So to summarize briefly, and I'm going to get into the specific wording, but to summarize briefly, uh, the proposal which was published in February proposes to do a number of, of main things. The first of which is to recognize the rights of the child as an individual. The idea is that the current framework recognises the rights of the child only incidentally as a member of the family unit. So the child isn't seen as being an autonomous individual, uh, an autonomous rights bearer in his own right. The child instead is seen as a member of the constitutionally recognised marital family, and the child's rights are protected indirectly through protecting the family unit. This proposal proposes instead to recognise the rights of the child as an individual. The proposal also um, intends to adopt the two key principles of the Children's Rights Convention, the best interest principle, which as I say, we already have in our legislation, we've just found it hasn't been, been working perhaps quite as it was intended to work, uh, and secondly, the child's right to be heard, which Emily has mentioned uh, quite a bit, and, I, and I'll talk a little more about that. Following on then from reports such as the Ryan report and so on, we see also reference being made to the child's right to protection. Um, and obviously, given the revelations which have come out in the area of child abuse, uh, the child's right to protection is a very topical issue um, and, again, something which is a key principle of the Children's Rights Convention. And finally, then, the other main aspect of the proposal is the question of intervention. And where at the moment, as I said, the test is exceptional cases and the court have construed that test of exceptional cases extremely narrowly, um, applying it really to only the most severe cases of risk to a child involving death or serious harm. Uh, we see this proposal uh, seeking to change that test to the proportionality test, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. And so the question is, will this be put to a referendum later this year, and that, that remains to be seen. Um, so to look at the actual wording itself, the opening lines of the proposal that was set down by the Oireachtas Committee uh, are that the state shall cherish all the children of the state equally. Now there are two things going on with this line, one of which is that it's harking back to the wording of the 1916 Proclamation of Independence. Uh, it's perhaps a little off the money in that regard, in that the, the 1916 uh, Proclamation used the word all the children of the nation and, and was really intended to refer to the idea of cherishing um, Republicans and Unionists, Catholics and Protestants equally, rather than specifically referring to children in the sense of minors. Um, but it has historical resonance, and more specifically, it is concerned with the idea of ensuring that all children, regardless of the marital status of their parents, enjoy the same constitutional rights. Uh, we have conflicting case law at present as to whether or not children whose parents are unmarried are able to fully rely on the rights guaranteed by Articles 41 and 42. And so this proposal is designed to remove doubt on that question, um, and we'll see this coming up again in a moment. <coughs> 
Secondly then, the state recognises and acknowledges the natural and imprescriptible rights of all children, including their right to have their welfare regarded as a primary consideration. So we see again there the welfare best interest principle coming in there and being, being mentioned and couched in terms of a right of the child. Um, and shall, as far as practicable, protect and vindicate those rights. Now this statement uh, is very similar to the existing provision which recognises the natural and imprescriptible rights of all children. Uh, that was deemed to be uh, a phrasing which should be retained. Uh, it makes specific reference to the welfare principle and reinforces that then in the next provision where it says quite clearly that in the resolution of all disputes concerning guardianship, adoption, custody, care or upbringing of a child, uh, the welfare and best interest, so it uses both phrases there, um, I suppose in a sense joining the, the, closing the gap between the Irish legislation which refers to welfare and the Children's Rights Convention which refers to best interests. Uh, the welfare and best interest of the child shall be the first and paramount consideration. Now significant, uh, what is significant about that wording is the broad scope of it. It refers to a range of different cases, guardianship, adoption, custody and care, all being reasonably specific, but then upbringing being a much more general concept which could include issues such as health, such as education and so on. Um, and then in the event that something does fall outside of those five phrases, the preceding provision which refers to the child's right to have their welfare regarded as a primary consideration, uh, again is fairly broadly couched and could potentially catch something which is deemed to fall outside of that. Now by putting this into the constitution, why is this significant? It's something that has repeatedly been called for in the reform reports by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, by the Constitution Review Group, and in the literature. Will this make a change? Will it change the way the welfare principle operates in Irish law, or will it not? And the reason you have to ask that question is because Article 41, of course, is not being amended. Um, I should have said at the outset that the proposal is to amend Article 42. Article 42, at present, refers to education. And what this is intending to do is to rename Article 42 to children, to retain the education wording um, at, in the second half of the article, but to add in some additional provisions relating to children at the start. So the question is, how will this interact with Article 41? And that, to an extent, is something which is open to interpretation by the courts. Uh, and there are two ways in which one could look at it. One would be that the welfare principle or the best interest principle is now given constitutional status. Uh, in the hierarchy of laws, it is now alongside Article 41, in that they are both constitutional principles. And that on, the, uh, on a, a plain reading of the language, which refers to the welfare and best interest of the child being the first and paramount consideration, that if that is a constitutional principle and it says it is the first and paramount consideration, that that should come ahead, come ahead of the rights of parents or of the family unit, because they are both constitutional principles. That is one possible interpretation, and I think if you read the report uh, and the reasoning in the report, that is how it was intended to work. The other possibility, of course, is that a court may look at this and may interpret this provision as remaining subservient to Article 41 that Article 41 in protecting the family unit may still uh, be, be viewed by a particular judge as um, having some sort of dominance uh, over the proposals relating to the welfare principle in Article 42. This is something which remains to be seen. Um, Carol Coulter in the Irish Times has described Article 41 as the elephant in the room and just having briefly spoken to Rosemary before and I think she, she may have some similar views and, and may elaborate on that. Um, but. I think there are two possible interpretations. I think the intention of the, the Oireachtas Committee report was that the welfare principle, by being elevated to constitutional status, would make the welfare and the best interests of the child genuinely the first and paramount consideration. But the fact that Article 41 isn't being altered leaves the door open for, for some potential interpretation and controversy on that point. Uh, to move on then, we see in the proposal uh, a proposal to specifically recognise a number of individual rights of the child. Uh, the report is very clear that this is not intended to be an exhaustive list. It is intended to uh, recognise, as you see, and vindicate the rights of all children as individuals, again, rather than a subset of the family unit, including, so the word including uh, is intended to indicate that this is not exhaustive. 
First of all, the right of the child to such protection and care as is necessary for his or her safety and welfare, again, harking back to the child abuse reports and so on. Uh, secondly, the right of the child to an education. The Constitution at present recognises the duty of the state to provide for free primary education. The courts have interpreted that as conferring a corresponding right on the child to receive education. Um, this is simply making that explicit in the text of the Constitution itself and is thus not that significant. And thirdly, the right of the child's voice to be heard in any judicial and administrative proceedings affecting the child have in regard to the child's age and maturity. Um, if we come back to the point that this has not yet gone to the Attorney General and there is still scope for change, I think this is one that probably needs to be changed. Presumably this right belongs to the child and not to his or her voice. Um, and so the wording there <laughs> will presumably have to be slightly tweaked. Uh, but this is something which came rather late to the game in one sense, that a lot of the earlier reform proposals all focused in on the welfare or best interest principle. And the right to be heard didn't feature as strongly up until much more recently. Some people are critical of this proposal for being too narrow. It refers specifically to judicial and administrative proceedings. It doesn't refer to a broader right to be heard in other settings such as health or education. Um, so you could criticise it on that ground as not being progressive enough. Having said that, it did come quite late to the game. I think many people perhaps didn't expect it to be in a proposal at all. Uh, and certainly in its present form, it does represent progress, uh, if not quite as much progress as some people would like goes on then in the proposal to say that the state acknowledges that the primary and natural carers, educators and protectors of the welfare of a, of a child are the child's parents and guarantees to respect the right and responsibility of parents to provide according to their means for the education and welfare of their children. This takes the existing Article 42.1, slightly rephrases it. Uh, it's designed to reassure people who see this amendment as being anti-family or anti-parent by reaffirming the fact that we do start from the point that the family and parents are usually the best people to protect their children and to provide for their welfare. Uh, it slightly changes the language of the existing provision by focusing on parents rather than the family uh, and it also explicitly mentions care and welfare where the existing provision only mentions education. So as I say, it's a reaffirmation of, of a lot of the principles that are currently in the Constitution uh, and reassurance for those who may be uh, perhaps sceptical or worried about this amendment. And then finally, um, the last one I'm going to deal with, I'm going to leave adoption to one side and I believe Rosemary is, is looking at adoption. Um, where the parents of any child fail in their responsibility towards such child, the state as guardian of the common good shall by proportionate means, as shall be regulated by law, endeavour to supply or supplement the place of the parents. There are two significant changes here, the first of which is that it says supply or supplement. The current provision refers only to supplying the place of the parents. By introducing also the idea of supplementing the place of the parents, this brings us back to the idea of earlier intervention, uh, earlier, less serious intervention in the form of support for families as opposed to, to removing children from families to try and address problems at an earlier stage and avoid them getting to the stage where you are genuinely looking at a risk of death or serious harm to a child. Um, but secondly, the proportionality test. The test is moving from exceptional cases as defined by the courts as involving a, a risk of death or serious, uh, serious harm to a child. It's moving to the proportionality test which provides protection for both sets of parties. The proportionality test, as, as well established in the courts domestically and also uh, under the European Convention on Human Rights, requires that intervention, if it is to be legitimate, must pursue a legitimate aim, firstly. Secondly, it must uh, use the least restrictive means of achieving that aim and it must go no further than is necessary to achieve that aim. So you have quite a detailed test and a lot of case law developing how that test works uh, regarding what circumstances must be established before intervention will be permissible. Now that provides protection for the family and it provides protection for parents because it provides a very strict set of criteria through which um, intervention must take place and if you cannot show that you have a legitimate aim and that the means are uh, pursuing that aim in a manner that goes no further than is necessary to achieve that aim, if the state cannot show that then intervention cannot take place. As against that, 
it moves us away from the idea that the child has to be hanging over a cliff before the state can actually get involved. Uh, it moves us towards a situation where you have greater flexibility in the intervention process, that you have the possibility of lesser forms of intervention uh, supplementing the parents. Um, and because of the idea of proportionality, um, I guess the idea is that the lesser the intervention, well then the lesser the harm that must be demonstrated to justify that form of intervention. Um, so that moves us away from the exceptional cases test, it moves us away from the idea that things have to be right at the most extreme level before state intervention can take place. Um, so that, in, in a nutshell, is what the amendment proposes to do with respect to the key issues surrounding uh, the child's uh, rights as an individual, the discrimination between marital children and extramarital children, uh, the child's right to be heard, and the principle that the child's best interest should be the first and paramount consideration. Um, to summarise in all of that, what we see from the literature and the reports dating back to 1993 is that the experts do fairly, uh, I won't say unanimously because as soon as I do somebody will say I don't agree, uh, but the, the overwhelming body of opinion is that there is a need for change in this area, a need for constitutional amendment. I would certainly echo Emily's point that a constitutional amendment is not going to fix everything. It is one part of a picture here, uh, of a very big and very complicated picture, and certainly uh, a serious issue would be supplying resources. unless the care system is adequately resourced, well then it doesn't matter what legal tool, tools you, it has available to it. In the absence of adequate resources, we are going to see repeats of the types of tragic cases that we've been hearing about in the media a lot in recent times. But certainly, a constitutional amendment is one necessary part of change in this area. Uh, and this has been well documented over nearly 20 years worth of discussion in this area. Uh, and that at the moment, it would seem to be the case that there, the legal tools aren't all there for uh, state services to adequately protect children, uh, and that has led to a culture of excessive non-intervention. Uh, certainly, nobody wants to see excessive state intervention, but we have seen the balance tip too far in the other direction. So a constitutional amendment um, is something which is necessary. This particular proposal, uh, my view on this proposal um, would be that it is pretty balanced on the whole. It doesn't change Article 41. That does leave the scope open for it to be a little ineffective. But having said that, I do believe there is a way of interpreting it so as to, to make it fit for purpose. And that if you look to the report and the reasoning in the report behind the amendment, um, my own view is that it would be uh, clear that it is intended to constitutionalize the best interest principle um, to give it an equal legal footing to Article 41 and then the language by referring to it being the first and paramount consideration to genuinely make the best interest of the child the paramount number one consideration for the court in cases affecting children. On the other side of it, uh, there, is, there is certainly opposition to changing the Constitution. Uh, for all of the reports and all of the debate we have which talks about the need for this amendment, there is certainly quite an amount of opposition to this amendment also. The opposition generally uh, puts out the view that this is going to undermine the family in such a way as to lead to excessive state intervention. Uh, you hear people citing cases from other jurisdictions where uh, children are taken away from their parents for being too fat and various other things like that. Uh, will it do this? I don't believe it will. I believe that by keeping Article 41 untouched, by again reaffirming the idea that parents are the primary carers uh, and protectors of their children, um, and by implementing the proportionality test, which as I said, strikes a balance between uh, the rights of, the, of parents and the family on the one hand and the rights of the child on the other, and by establishing a strict set of criteria through which uh, intervention must take place. We are certainly not going to go from a culture of non-intervention to a culture of excessive intervention overnight. Uh, it's not where we're coming from and I don't think it's where we're going. The position will remain that the family has strong constitutional rights, but we will see the test for intervention changing and we see the best interest principle uh, and the way it interacts with those family rights changing a little bit so as to slightly tip the scales 
uh, from the serious imbalance which exists at present. But it's not going to shift the scales all the way over to the other side. Uh, and when you hear people referring to cases from other jurisdictions where uh, excessive intervention has occurred, you always need to ask yourself, did that country have strong protection for the family unit in its constitution? And the answer is almost invariably no, because Ireland is one of the few countries that does. Uh, so you always need to take that uh, with a healthy degree of scepticism. Um, so I think what, it's, what it does is it, it strikes more of a balance between the individual child uh, and recognising the rights of the child as, as an autonomous individual um, rather than simply a member of the family unit. Um, and it also specifically enumerates a number of, of, of rights of the child which uh, to date have not been properly protected, uh, such as the right to be heard, such as the right to care and protection. Um, and so on, ho on the whole, is the amendment perfect? No, it's not. Um, but it has gone through an incredibly lengthy debate and lengthy political process. And given the politics surrounding this, my own view is that the amendment at this stage is as good as it's going to be if it is going to be put to a referendum and passed. Uh, Any time very strong proposals have been put forward on this issue, we've seen politicians getting very nervous and backing away. We have cross-party support on this issue. Um, and where you have cross-party support, where you have wording that on the whole is strong and principled, there are some places where progress could be made. Um, but if we are to get this through in a referendum, my own view is that this is, at this stage, about as good as it is going to get. Um, so I'll leave it there and I'll welcome any questions at the end. Thank you.